I'm uh, Lauri Tähtinen. I'm a FIA non-resident fellow in Washington, and uh, we're here today to discuss uh, U.S. trade policy and the role it plays more broadly in the world. I want to thank everyone at uh, FIA, uh, especially Mayu, for uh, helping organize this webinar. And um, I'm joined today, uh, but here also uh, from Washington, but you know, by Stan Voiger. Uh, he's a resident scholar um, in economic policy at the American Enterprise Institute and also a uh, visiting lecturer in economics at, at Harvard University and holds uh, other positions, uh, fellowships uh, around the world. And also uh, Saila Turtiainen, uh, who's a visiting senior fellow at, at FIA and was pre uh, previously a senior advisor in trade policy at the uh, Confedera Confederation of Finnish Industries and uh, is an expert on free trade agreements, trade defense, U.S. trade policy, and now, of course, the ongoing uh, U.S.-China trade war. And the idea here is really ultimately uh, to have a conversa conversation between the three of us and then also get some Q&A questions from all of you uh, in writing in, and under the conversation feature here. But uh, so before I turn it over to uh, Stan and Sila for their opening remarks, I want to make some comments on a briefing paper that I wrote, and it was uh, published earlier today, and it's 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 on this very uh, topic. So, uh, and that, of course, I was also a group effort. So, I mean, at least half a dozen people at FIA offered comments in the paper and making it a lot more cogent along the way. Uh, I hope that I don't forget to mention somebody, but Anni, Charlie, Mika, Le Leonard, Mika, and also Stan and Sila had a look at it. So it was called Beyond Trade War in Washington and um, uh, the United States and our less global, less global future. And there were a few points uh, that I wanted to make uh, in that paper. And the first was uh, really that the grand trajectory of the United States has shifted from, from something uh, it, from a leader to something of a vocal skeptic uh, it, of trade integration. And and we should only expect uh, Joe Biden to uh, change the tone, but not really the substance of this. Uh, another thing uh, that I highlighted was that uh, the president's trade promotion authority is set to expire this summer. And and it appears right now that Washington is not ready for any new uh, major trade agreements. And, and when the time comes for them, they're most likely to be associated with some sort of broader strategic project. I look in some detail at the United States, Mexico, Canada agreement and, and the ongoing uh, trade war with China as the backdrop to that, why that was such an easy go. Uh, eventually in 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 Washington. And then a, th uh, a third thing is really how the rules based trading uh, system need, needs new champions. And while the US may not be willing to play the role that it was playing and it has played in the past, others and here I'm obviously looking at Brussels and the rest of Europe, uh, you know, they can also help make it so that the US comes along uh, along the way on what on the way. But really, uh, just to make a couple, a couple of, I don't want to go on for any much longer at all about uh, the briefing paper. It's there available on the website for people to have a closer look at. But the, you know, a couple of things that you know, from in the background, that I do want to sort of highlight that I don't think have received enough play. And the first thing really is that over the course of the last ten or so years, Americans have become much more positive on trade. Uh, if you look at the Gallup polls on this. Americans generally think trade's a great idea, but as soon as you put a, the, a deal in front of them, of even say that you're going to have a trade agreement, Americans start thinking about closed factories and and this deindustrialized Midwest and all these kinds of images, and that's a sort of paradox that everybody will have to sort of live with uh, and and to try to find a way to uh, uh, to find you know use this sort of positive force in and and get something get something going uh, using that, but without running into the issues that, you know, much sort of trade deal and trade agreement talk, you know, uh, run, you sort of runs into. And the second thing, and this is a much more negative one, uh, and it's the re it's the rejection uh, of the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership 
that happened at the very beginning of uh, the Trump presidency. And the way I talk about in the paper is that it's really the biggest betrayal of allies in a century since the end of World War One. And I don't think I mean, this is this hasn't got nearly as much play, I think, in Europe and he, as it has in the US and even in Washington. I don't think people seriously understand, or at least it's not the first topic that comes to mind uh, from the Trump years. But, you know, understand the extent to which this has changed the U.S. position in the world and the U.S. position on the issue of trade, perhaps for the longer term. So those are kind of two huge issues that I have had at the back back of my mind uh, when writing this briefing paper. And we'll hopefully get to some of that also uh, in our conversation. But now, uh, you know, sort of give an idea of what this session is about is really to have more of a conversation, a round table around this topic to get different perspectives on the table, the three of us, but then later on also uh, also the rest of you and really get a sort of sense of which way the wind is blowing uh, through Washington right now. Uh, the role that trade has played and will play in, in the US global presence and what the implications are for Europe and, and and the rest of the world. And if there's something that Europeans can do and should do that Americans are not willing to do uh, right now. And and one of these the main, one of the major driving things behind this is, of course, that right now we should be all thinking about how um, how global supply chains could deliver COVID-19 vaccines and uh, how the sort of incipient global cooperation and on climate change really needs to be uh, worked through trade as well. And and the kind of level of discomfort that many players have with the current trading system is not is not helping, uh, you know, accomplish and attain these goals. So uh, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Stan, who can, you know, make a few uh, opening remarks of his own. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Laurie, and I will try to follow your example and not go uh, for, for too long, thank you also to to Fia for uh, for for having me uh, on today. So, uh, as all of you know, you know the Biden administration is now in in full control of the the U.S. government. The House and the Senate are under, uh, albeit narrow, Democratic control. Um, and I I think so far the focus has been very domestic and really just focused on dealing with. Um, the COVID pandemic itself and with the economic fallout from it. Um, I think as we move further into the year and also on the uh, international side, the uh, Biden administration is going to be very focused on a lot of damage repair and on sort of pre-existing priorities that the Demo Democratic Party has had for uh, for a number of years now. And so I, I would agree with, with Lori that there isn't a ton of appetite for um, for new trade liberalization efforts. And so instead, I think what we'll see is obviously, you know, more work on COVID and then on the legislative front, maybe an effort to to secure voter rights, um, some sort of immigration legislation, perhaps later in the year, uh, a heavily climate policy focused uh, infrastructure bill. All of those are going to be heavy lifts legislatively. They're going to demand a lot of attention from the administration. And so I, I think that will uh, that will make uh, trade policy much less of a focus than it was during the Trump administration. Now, uh, that may be uh, good news in some respects, but I do think it'll be you know very different in the in the salience that uh, that trade policy will will have. And so. Um, I, I don't think we'll see dramatic course corrections there. And so I think that leads me to agree with Laurie that what we'll see is a trajectory shift. Um, at the same time, I see some positive notes too. I think the Biden administration in general will be much more sympathetic toward the various multilateral institutions we have, including the WTO, and you know, at least trying a little bit to make the WTO uh, work as intended. We've seen that now in the... Um, process around the appointment of the new director general. Uh, I also think, and this is true across policy areas and not just in trade, that we'll see a much less choppy policymaking process. Obviously, we've we've seen that already just in the domestically in the COVID sphere, right, where you you don't get Biden running out there uh, announcing new drugs he's discovered that will uh, 
magically end the the pandemic. Instead, you have a much more expert oriented, process oriented, uh, uh, you know, approach to the pandemic that involves, you know, under promising and over delivering in an, in an almost mechanistic uh, way. And then thirdly, I do think the administration and we've seen a little bit of that already, both with the UK and with the EU. I think the uh, administration will try to resolve some of the outstanding issues with Europe and other allies, if perhaps not with with China. Um, so that's the that, that's sort of the, the the positive elements. I think on the downside, uh, as Lori pointed out as well, while general public opinion on trade has gotten much more positive over the past few years, I think, in, in to some extent, out of negative partisanship in response to Trump administration actions. Uh, but also just because people have, I think, reconsidered some of the advantage and disadvantage of globalization. While while that is all true, uh, I think for for presidential and and senatorial politics, the uh, the important voters are still pretty skeptical about trade. I think they're, you know, while this, this may be a little bit overblown, at least in the political imagination, voters in sort of the deindustrialized Midwest loom very large for presidential candidates, um, and you know some of those Senate seats. Are, are pretty competitive. And so I think they have a disproportionate weight in how uh, the US federal government approaches uh, trade. Um, I also think that there is some underlying discontent with the whole idea of free trade and the way it works. And that's always been present on the Democratic side. I think the big shift has really been on the on the Republican side in, in recent years. On the Democratic side, you have had a strong uh, role for the labor movement um, going back all the way to to, to FDR, really, um, that comes with uh, some with much more of a focus on the losers from uh, from new trade agreement. Um, you saw this in the confirmation hearing for the new U.S. trade representative, where she really, you know, instead of focusing on so the efficiency gains and the gains from trade uh, that come with new trade agreement, she really focused on the on the downsides as well. We'll we'll see similar. Thinking in, I think, an emphasis on on environmental and labor rights that will make uh, trade agreements with uh, with poorer countries very hard to 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 reach in in the current administration. Um, you're already seeing some of this materializing, some of this potential downside. Uh, one of the first things the Biden administration did was to uh, was to restore tariffs on aluminum imports from the UAE, which is not a not a huge deal, but just symbolic. It's something the Trump administration removed in its last days, uh, and they they immediately put those back under uh, what I think everyone agrees are pretty flimsy uh, national security uh, justifications. Um, and then finally, one of the first things Biden did was to double down on on Buy America provisions in uh, in public procurement. And so those I think are all uh, you know both reasons and and symptoms of. Uh, uh, what could be, uh, you know, a continued level of protectionism that is that is greater than than what I would like to see, but I think is 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 in line with uh, what we've seen over the over the past few years. Now, before I end my opening remarks here, um, and I can go for as long as you want, Laurie. So you should really, uh, at some point, cut me off. I want to highlight. So, I, I, with in the relationship with Europe specifically. Um, I think there's a there's a there's some issues that deserve attention because they they could easily become pretty major irritants. I think first and foremost it's digital service taxes, which a lot of European countries have either imposed or are considering imposing. I, I think here in the U.S. people usually see those as basically tariffs on uh, on imports from the U.S. that are targeting uh, a number of U.S. companies that have been very successful in industries where Europe just hasn't been very successful. And I think, you know, I, I think that's just a money grab, right? Where people say, okay, well, where, where you, European policymakers say, we see these massive corporate profits, we want our share of that, uh, whether that wh whether uh, uh, we should be allowed to under traditional uh, apportionment rules or or not. And so I think that has the potential to, to create some tension. On tech policy uh, more broadly, right? And so I think, Think about data protection, about you know um, privacy rules, those kinds of things. I think there the Biden administration may actually be kind of happy if Europe uh, regulates a little more uh, aggressively than than the U.S. Uh, is able to do with the 
you know, current dynamics in Congress. I think there, US, US, certainly some elements in the U.S. administration would be happy to to piggyback on on European measures. But it is a thin line between tar- being seen as targeting U.S. firms versus helping the U.S. regulate uh, industries where there's a lot of political demand for for regulation. Um, I think the German position on on Nord Stream is 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 a problematic one for for people who are more Russia hawkish, which obviously has become a major uh, a part of, uh, of 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 democratic foreign policy thinking over the past few years, as the Russian government was seen as um, helping uh, President Trump politically um, and also in just generally interfering in U.S. affairs, posing a threat to to the political stability of some Eastern European countries. So I think that's a potentially sensitive issue. Um, and I think I will, I, will, uh, I will leave it there. We can talk about a number of other, other items, but I, will, uh, I, will, I don't want to go on for too long in my, my opening remarks. Yeah, thank you, Stan. I'll make one quick comment before I give this out. I'll just say that the uh, TTIP, uh, during TTIP, of course, this public procurement question was something that Europeans were frustrated with, that it really seemed impossible to open that up that the U- U.S. public procurement will be a national issue, but we can talk about that a little bit more later. So, uh, Sila, please. Thank you, Lauri, and um, thank you for the invitation to come here and speak today. And this topic is really close to my heart, so I was really happy that this is this is my first event at FIA, uh, where I just started uh, last week. And, um, Lauri's uh, paper on on that was published today is really excellent, um, excellent paper, and I hope that everybody uh, takes the time to read it as well. Um, in addition to listening to the discussion here today, um, well, as we all know by now, China is at the heart of 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 the U.S. trade policy. Otherwise, Biden hasn't really made clear where his priorities lie geographically. So um, the Biden ad- administration needs to decide whether to devote uh, its diplomatic resources to restoring relationship with Europe or whether it wants to prioritize maybe its relationship with like-minded uh, Asian countries. And I, I think from this perspective as well, it's quite interesting to compare a bit Biden's and then EU's trade policy goals and how well they match. Um, Generally speaking, I think the major difference in in EU and US trade policy seems to be at the moment that EU sees trade policy mainly as a tool to increase prosperity, uh, whereas the US sees it uh, more as an instrument for great power rivalry. Um, Looking at the EU's uh, new trade policy strategy that was just published last month, it appears that the EU might be moving in the same direction gradually. Um, But of course, the EU's plans to get uh, tough on trade is not all good news for the US, as it might also be in the receiving end of EU's new assertive trade policy, if the EU and the US are not able to solve their disputes. But at least on rhetorical level, there seems to be a lot of similarities between Biden's and EU's trade policy. Uh, Biden's emphasis on climate as well as doing trade policy that benefits the middle class resonates well in the EU. And also both sides uh, want want to promote fairer trade and digital economy as well as resilient supply chains. And uh, enforcement of trade rules is also at the core of trade policy on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, China is also gradually taking center states um, uh, in EU's trade policy as well. Uh, the more assertive trade policy that I, I just mentioned is directly directed mostly on China. Um, And there seems to be some shared willingness between the EU and the US to do closer cooperation on China-related issues. But it's far from clear whether this initial interest will actually transform into more concrete action. Um, The EU wants to avoid getting caught in the middle of the US-China rivalry and and is quite worried that the pressure from the US will now uh, increase under Biden to pick sides. (laughs) 
um, during Obama's presidency, the EU and US tried to deepen their cooperation and create a common front towards China by negotiating a FTA or TTIP as it was called. Um, but I think it's important to note that TTIP didn't fail because we ran out of time when Trump was elected in 2016. Uh, but the main problem was the lack of ability to make compromises and more difficult concessions to each other. Um, this, this was made impossible in the EU by the populist opposition in some EU countries, and that was massively, massively um, amplified by social media and, and even conspiracy theories. So TTIP ended up, ended up showing the limitations of very ambitious transatlantic cooperation on trade policy. And it might be that not enough has changed since. Um, but when I was going through Biden's trade policy on agenda for this year, um, it was very easy to pinpoint what kind of goals Biden had, has in mind for trade policy. It's the tackling the bad pandemic, getting the economy back on track, making workers the focal point, and then prioritizing climate policy in international trade. But what remains unclear, however, is uh, how will the new administ administration promote these issues? Are they going to use the WTO? Are they going to negotiate new agreements? Or are they going to assort to unilateral action only? Um, in its trade policy, the EU makes it clear that it wants to use all, all, deals, all these tools to reach uh, trade policy objectives. But engage, engaging and coordinating with like-minded partners is definitely the first step in Biden's trade policy. But actually achieving concrete progress uh, in his uh, trade policy objective would require more than, more than just engaging. Um, well, Biden has stated that he wants the US to re-engage and, and to be a leader at the WTO. However, I think this promise rings hollow a bit. There isn't even a dedicated section on the WTO in his trade agenda for this year. And so, so far, there hasn't been any promises made that the US would stop blocking the nominations for, for the WTO appellate body which have left the dispute settlement there in a limbo during Trump's presidency. Um, and I think it's important to note that the skepticism towards the WTO and especially, especially towards the dispute settlement is not limited to Trump's administration, but is, is more broadly shared in the US. And um, unlike, I, unlike US and, and the EU has put the reform of WTO as, as a top priority in its trade strategy. Um, and hopefully, of course, and is, is definitely hoping that it will get the US behind, behind this um, reform project as well. But it seems that the expectations for a solution in the short run are, are, are not very high. The problems with the WTO go, of course, well beyond issues related to US or China's action or the lack of them. The organization seems to be almost paralyzed by the consensus-based decision-making, and there isn't no genuine shared willingness for any major reforms that would, that would end the deadlock that, that, that the organization finds itself. Well, the EU has always been a very strong supporter of the WTO in principle, at least. It has, it has also been very active in negotiating bilateral trade agreements for a long time now. And these efforts have left the EU with one of the most comprehensive networks of trade agreements in the world. And this network of FTAs has always been EU's plan B for the WTO. And I think that's something that the US is lacking, despite its criticism towards the current system. Mm, the FDAs that EU has made bilaterally have made it possible for it to liberalize trade, develop rules and also export it, its values. What was quite striking when I was going through the annual report on, on US trade policy was how far the US seems to be falling behind in creating its own FDA network. Currently, the US has uh, FDAs in force with 20 countries. 
um, whereas EU has uh, FDAs with more than 65 countries right now. And for the past 15 years, the US has not started any new negotiations that would have led to a new FDA. Um, though Trump was very active in, tra in trade policy, his changes to the US trade policy were not very consequential, except, of course, abandoning uh, TPP, which uh, Lauri already mentioned in his, his remarks. Um, well, Trump was able to reach some new trade uh, liberalization, but not actual new tr free trade agreements. So it, it, it is clear that the U.S. is falling behind as others are moving forward. And it's quite surprising that that there isn't any stronger push uh, within in the United States as as um, uh, this means that the EU exporters, for example, can co compete in better terms than the, their U.S. counterparts in many markets now. So I, I think this is this is something that it's it's quite strange to me that um, all the news that China is moving forward uh, with its own trade and investment deals and the EU is moving forward and and the rest of the world. So it, it would, would seem that the, maybe the pressure for Biden at some point to address uh, the lack of free trade agreements might might come um, a bit higher than than it is right now. But I'll, I think I'll stop here for now and look forward to the discussion. Uh, thank you, Sal. I'd like to now at this point remind everyone that you can start asking some questions in the, in the conversation por portion, or at least start thinking about what they might be. We'll I'll keep on you know asking some questions of Sal and Stan here and uh, get the conversation going. I think what I was going to say first with the thing with Sal is uh, so. In the U.S., there's recently been sort of this idea has been circulated that, you know, the WTO. So last year, the conversation still was that this was something that, you know, Senator Joss Hawley was, you know, passionate about, but, you know, who became obviously infamous this January for other things. But um, but now the sort of more broadly, this sort of disappointment has sort of set in because obviously, the, as Stan mentioned, Biden doesn't seem to have a very sort of tangible agenda uh, for the WTO. So one of the alternatives that's been raised is the OECD, and that could work as a sort of way of, you know, because it's also this sort of summit of democracies idea that 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 Biden has had. So, um, you know, as a way of like growing that club and using that for standard setting on something like the digital tax as well. What do you think is, Sila, what do you think at the sort of European Nordic general sort of end of things? How, what would the reception be for that? That, you know, you know, sort of growing the importance and may perhaps also the membership of o the OECD pretty radically. Well, yeah, I, I think it's, it was quite interesting to read your paper that you pick up this idea of, of um, OECD having a bigger role in the in the future but there are it's quite limited the role that the OECD can can have it's it, it can have some kind of maybe maybe a bigger role in 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 policy perhaps making um, a bit more binding rules for trade also in the future but then um, in a sense um it it cannot in any way replace the WTO as it is a forum where everybody has has tied their uh, tariffs as well. So if you're looking at leaving WTO, you're also leaving behind that um, that stability that it provides. Uh, although it's not moving forward, um, it's still very valuable for the for the companies doing international business so yeah what about what about stan do you have any thoughts on this sort of oec push for the oecd that seems to be coming from different quarters and in in, in in washington at least that's what i've been hearing yeah well so they i mean it, I, the biden administration is certainly more excited about that that possibility as as than the um than the trump administration tur turned out to be in the end i i just don't i don't think it's a I just don't think it's priority uh, 
for now. I think to to the extent that there are areas and um, and we 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 your your paper mentions this briefly too. I think climate policy may create. An, I think you want to have an area where there is uh, a, a domestic constituency that is interested in um, in new agreements and in prioritizing an issue. I think climate policy offers that a little bit. I don't think any any other area really directly does, which is frustrating. Um, I don't know. I you know I I think it's it's people really have to keep in mind that. The, the U.S. is very uh, domestically focused right now. If you look at the um, at the EU proposal for a revitalization of, a, of the transatlantic relationship, which I think um, the, the question here uh, is, is referencing, one of the first items in that in that document that the Commission issued when I think in December was, you know, we should set up a joint body to buy and distribute vaccines. Right. Even, even that, which really feels like the lowest hanging fruit you could possibly imagine. Even that hasn't really happened. Um, and so I think that that really indicates how difficult it is to to expect to expect a ton of new things to materialize. But maybe I'm too pessimistic uh, about that. I would also can I comment on some of the uh, uh, things we heard about China? Um, yeah, that's 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 Sila that Sila highlighted. Yeah, so I I strongly agree that it's not very clear what the Biden administration wants in that in that relationship. Part of it is that it's just very difficult, and so we saw that in the in the Trump during the Trump administration as well, right? There was a ton of attention on trade policy with um, uh, w with with China um, throughout the administration, right? The tariffs left and right to the discontent of the business community. Um, the, the USTR was suddenly super high profile. People knew the name of the Commerce Secretary, even though he was barely ever awake. Uh, you know, really a very different role that that uh, that trade policy played versus uh, what it did in a normal administration. And then ultimately, the, 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 the result of all that was that China promised to buy more soybeans and sent more business travelers to the US. It took years, and then you know that was the the substantive content of the what they called the the phase one deal, which obviously was the final deal. Um, and so none that that accomplished really nothing on reforming uh, China's uh, economic system. Obviously, that's you know maybe wasn't realistic, but certainly one of the complaints was that state-owned enterprises have too much of a role, that there's too much industrial policy going on that may involve IP theft and the like. None of that was really addressed in in the agreement. Um, the uh, you know while this is going on, China uh, got eliminated remaining political liberties in in Hong Kong. Uh, there was a there is an ongoing uh, you know human rights crisis in Xinjiang that the U.S. government sees as a genocide, uh, and really nothing was accomplished in any of those areas, even despite this immense focus on on Chinese. Uh, trade policy, and despite the fact that there were senior members of the previous administration, just as there are senior members of the current administration, that really care about those those issues, and so it, it shows you that you know even when there are you know there's there's a wide range of, of of objectives, it's not clear what you can do on some of them because China just doesn't care, I think, enough about U.S. tariffs to to make concessions on uh, on some of these issues, and so you end up in a situation where you inflict damage through tariffs, right, in part on yourself. Uh, without accomplishing anything beyond these very narrow uh, mercantilist goals, and so I, I, I don't know. I can I can see why the why the current administration also wonders. You know, is it really worth going down that route? What are we really going to accomplish with more hawkishness on, on on Chinese trade policy? Because you know we saw what happened in the previous administration. Now maybe the current administration. Is, is a little more competent, you know, uh, <laughs> and, and and surely that surely that matters. But you know, so much effort went into this, and ultimately, so little was accomplished that I'm just not sure um, uh, we're we're going to see, uh, you know, the administration accomplish much there on itself. Now, they will say, look, but we're going to form an alliance with our European and and East Asian partners, and that's going to, you know, produce a qualitatively different situation. Um, for for many of the for many of the reasons that that Sila pointed out, I'm skeptical of that. But 
know, we'll, we'll we'll see. Yeah, I I think I think you know that's very much sort of spot on. Like because what I've been hearing and reading out of the Biden administration really is that they they just constantly saying they're reviewing their China policy. They're reviewing their China policy. And it's pretty clear that they don't want to make any sort of call on what the next step is uh, anytime soon. I mean, the sort of domestic focus is really driving the way they're at least communicating it and probably also to some extent how they're going about doing things. And it's also because, I mean, this is something, you know, I'd actually like to get, you know, your thoughts on, too. I mean, one of the most sort of spectacular things in the last few years has been the extent to which trade policy, which used to be like, you know, a policy field that's connected to other policy fields, but at the same time, like a clearly distinguishable one, you know, has been, you know, connected to sanctions, you know, other forms of foreign policy. Also, even though they didn't, you know, speak its name, also industrial policy during the Trump era, it was very clear that industrial policy was being done in the name of trade policy. I'm like, do you, do you think, and this is a question I'd like to hear both of your uh, sort of thoughts on, um, do you think there's a chance that during this administration, you know, these would become perhaps more disentangled and we'd have a sort of clearer sense yeah. of this is this is economic, this is trade policy and this is uh, foreign policy and this is industrial policy? Or, or are we going to be in, you know, dealing with the sort of this level of complexity for qu quite some time? Who wants to go first? Well, I can just shortly say that um, I, I, I guess this is a trend that you can also see within the EU as well. That we are moving in that direction that every, everything is linked together and trade policy is not, uh, it's becoming more and more an instrument for something else and not a policy uh, in its own right. And I, I think that's, um, that uh, trend is uh, really intensifying in the EU and I don't really have high hopes that it would be different in the US under Biden as well. So the world is quite complex and, and security and, and technology and foreign policy is very tangled up, up in, in, in trade policy and I, I think sanctions and export controls are, are a good, really good area where, where that is very concretely shown today. And, and that's an area where, where Biden uh, probably will also continue the same same kind of policy um, that that Trump did, although just having a bit more dialogue with with its partners, hopefully. hopefully but but otherwise, I'm I'm not expecting ma major changes. So I, I would so I, I disagree a little bit, at least in the context of trade relations with with Mexico and with Central America and countries, where I do think there's been at least a bit of an effort to to move the migration issues away from 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 threats in the trade arena and so there i would say okay you know maybe we we see a little bit of a reversion to more you know traditional blocks of issues coupled together uh, as opposed to what we saw during the during the trump administration but if, but of course that was also an area where um it was it was really a pretty uh, aggressive approach that the that the Trump admin, uh, administration uh, took, and so I, I think that's there. Maybe we're seeing it a little bit. On the other hand, of course, there are other issues, and you know, here environmental and labor issues are the obvious ones. There, where that in a democratic administration are a much more logical uh, accompaniment for for trade policy than than they would be under a Republican administration. So. Uh, you know, I think, uh, as we've mentioned a couple of times, I think there, there, it, it'll be hard to imagine trade negotiations that are that take place in complete isolation from from environmental goals to the extent that that trade negotiations will will actually uh, will actually happen. Um, so I, I early I, I want to there's a question here about the EU proposal to establish an EU US Trade and Technology Council that is in the that same proposal that I mentioned that the EU submitted to the US. I mean, I like I, I think it's fine, you know, they ultimately it's one way to say, OK, we're we, we've given up on TTIP and now we're going to we're going to call our negotiations something else. Um, I, I think it, it to the extent that there will be enthusiasm for this, I think it's just a sign that there's not going to be a TTIP. 
uh, which I, you know, which is probably realistic. But I don't think it'll do. Right? You have two negotiating partners ultimately, and what they call their phone line is, I don't think, a super central issue. I think it's more that the you know the the commission wants to puts together a proposal and they want to have something in there on trade. Obviously, they realize there's not going to be a trade deal, and so they come up with a label for a for a discussion forum. I don't think that will have any uh, substantive uh, impact necessarily. Uh, if I can just add to that, I, I absolutely agree. But it, it, as I mentioned in my my uh, initial remarks, was that TTIP showed us that trade policy is not very easy area for for the EU and US to do very ambitious cooperation. So that um, for that reason, it's good that the cooperation will go to other areas as well. So so that the, we, we have a trade and technology council. I think the area of technology is something that we can find a bit easier to do cooperation than basically just on trade. Yeah. And so then and going back to your earlier comments about the OECD and a, a comment we, we got here in the in the chat, I, I agree that the, I, I, I certainly agree that the OECD is not going to replace the WTO. I do think the OECD is a logical forum for discussions about tax policy, for example, to the extent that those are um, those are going to be relevant. I and, and there's been an ongoing effort on the corporate tax front. I don't I, I think the parties are pretty far apart there, but we'll we'll, we'll see where that where that goes. I'd be curious to hear it. So it sounds like you you've you've thought about this. How, do you think we can separate out those tax discussions from the tech policy discussions? And is that what the what the EU is trying to do to pretend that the that the digital service taxes are are entirely separate from from an industry specific issue? Well, um, I like to hear Lauri's thoughts on this as well. But I, I think, it, um, yeah, you're right that that, that the from from the US perspective, they see uh, EU's plans as just taxing their companies. But it's not only an EU US issue. Other countries have also uh, implemented or are planning to implement digital taxes. So this is a bigger issue than just between the US and EU. Colum and, Colombia, for example. Yeah, yeah. yeah, or India and so on. But Lauri. Yeah, no, I, I was I was just thinking because well, this was uh, what Silas said very well about uh, in her remarks earlier about how the uh, how the the EU spent the Trump years building this network of these free trade agreements. And if it's a sort of like some of these issues are going to be settled within, within the OECD at the same time, the EU also has these free trade agreements to go alongside that 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 sort of package. But uh, that forms a package. While with the U.S., it's not entirely clear to me what you know if the WTO is not used uh, as 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 the sort of other forum, uh, other forum for these things. What what exactly is it that the U.S. now has because it doesn't have T the TPP? And I mean that's really a, it's or much less a TTIP. And I mean I think that's the. I've always kind of been of the view that the TPP would have happened and it would be would have been. Would have really changed the sort of course of uh, U.S. global relations. I think it would have been much easier in some ways for the U.S. also to sort of shift away from this sort of sort of more sort of militaristic stance that it has had for the last 20 years in global affairs uh, if the TPP had come into force because they would have a replacement forum uh, for that. So there's a lot of I mean, even in the paper, I don't go quite as deep into that, but I think it would have been a sort of alternative vehicle for a lot of different things. And then once the TPP had been functioning, maybe maybe something with Europe would have been necessary for Europeans themselves as well. So uh, because I mean, the US is a curious beast because it has both sort of in some ways it's sort of, for example, China trade profile is both the chi profile of a Brazil and uh, a Germany. So you know, considering how big of a market it is, it, it needs to sort of think in all these sort of different different terms uh, uh, when it comes to that. On the on the tech on the you know specifically in the tech stuff, I it's it's yeah as as you mentioned, it's really I think the emphasis of U.S. trade policy right now. And if there were a clear settlement between uh, between Brussels and Washington, that was then acceptable. You know, also in the Nordics and in San Francisco, uh, 
uh, it would be a lot easier to say, you know, go into Latin America and say, by the way, these are the terms of our digital trade. This is what the taxation regime looks like. You know, if you want to be, you know, if you, you want to play this game, uh, play game with us. And and the reality is that just as Europe doesn't really have, you know, very many tech giants going around Latin America, for example, has similar issues. I mean, there's, you know, so that's, you know, that's really there. I, I think the really interesting question, and I, and I that I can see as sort of a triangle uh, there, but then the you know how this all plays out and you know in connection to Asia and Asia Pacific or India is I think a very very sort of different question. Well, much less Africa, where you know that the Chinese footprint is much heavier already. Yeah, I wonder if the uh, to, part of it is that the that Europe, of course, has other instruments that it can use if it if it finds it irritating that there are American companies that are. Uh, securing what they see as monopoly profits in Europe, then obviously they they have antitrust uh, instruments they can use to and and have started and that they've started considering using at, at least to some extent. Um, you know, you can you can add more cookie warnings until the until no one makes a profit anymore on the internet. I guess is the is the alternative approach. No, I, I think that I think I think that makes sense. Yeah, and I think I think what you said earlier about um, uh, about how, in some ways, the Biden administration may be hoping that Brussels does some of its dirty work for it, you know, in terms of privacy and stuff that they don't need to sort of go head on to do it, and basically, it you know, basically just present it as a fait accompli that you know, this is how it is, and you might as well learn to live with it because. Either you adjust to this European policy agenda that's already been set, or we'll have to develop our own. Yeah. Then, rather than having to sort of take them on, uh, it is difficult though because it is not super clear what. Uh, so I, I do think it's a risky business for the for the EU, right? Because it's not super clear what the actual concerns are that people have here. So on the right, the concern is that I guess Twitter is mean to Trump and it has blocked its it blocked his account. Um, and they believe that, you know, some conservative journalists and pundits don't get enough attention on Facebook and Twitter, right? That's that's a core area of concern. Now, you can spin that as they have too much market power. And so maybe that could be addressed by, you know, antitrust tools that the EU has. On the left, I think the, the thing that Elizabeth Warren finds irritating is that Jeff Bezos is very wealthy. Uh, and I, I don't know that the EU can do much to, to address that. Um, and so, you know, like it, it, the, there, there's certainly digital service taxes aren't going to address the, the things that that the political discontent is about here. Uh, antitrust may a little bit, though. I, I don't think that anyone here wants wants the commission to go after Google search. Right? That's just not something that is some that is a politically salient, you know, uh, irritating <laughs> technology to people, um, and so I, 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 I do, I, I do find it a little difficult to to see precisely what uh, the substance would be of measures the EU could take that that, as you say, and as I implied earlier, would constitute doing the Biden's the Biden administration's dirty work for it. Um, maybe the 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 theory of change is that. By making Google less powerful and by making Amazon less powerful, everything else will become, you know, no matter what part of the organizations you attack, uh, you know, the whole uh, the whole ecosystem will become healthier. But it seems risky. I don't know. And it's and it's very and it's and it easily shades into, OK, we're going to impose massive fines on Google, which, you know, the 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 line between a fine and a tax is not always totally clear either right i think in these issues yeah no no makes perfect sense silo did you have anything on this right now or uh i was yeah because i was thinking we could start going through some sort of more systematically some of the sort of questions that we've been getting here uh there was already this i think you've has had a question about um uh that sort of ends with the question of uh will the suspension of an airbus boeing dispute duties give a positive spin for the bilateral corporation. So I think the sort of background 
background here really is that, you know, whether on aviation or steel or anything that, you know, if if we can make some headway uh, on those sort of old standing issues, some from the 80s and some more recent. Any any thoughts on that? Maybe just to say that I, I guess that was a really low hanging fruit, uh, kind of the minimum that you could expect uh, to get right now. Just um, because uh, even the issue itself is not uh, settled, but well, just taking some time out with the the duties right now. So at least um, um, the two sides are now on, on in the in the negotiations table with each other, and that that's a good first step. Not but not very good, but not very big one. No, I think I this is a it's a it's a unique sector, obviously, and I I think you could. You could have seen this, you know, go into negotiations even under the Trump administration. I don't think this is this is a dramatic turn for the better. I I would agree, but uh, let's let's sort of move on. Let's see the next one. Oh, what would you say about the Biden administration expectations regarding Europe vis-a-vis -vis China IPR theft 5G? Yeah, I have some thoughts on this, but let you one of you guys get, you know jump in first. Do you want to start, Stan? Sure. I, I mean, I think the Biden administration, on some level, would like for the EU to to block out Huawei entirely and 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 uh, build a European champion of 5G systems, perhaps named Nokia. Uh, I think that would be uh, that would be the ideal scenario. Um, and I on on intellectual property theft. Right. This is one of the many issues that I think the U.S. has with. With China, I don't think they, as, as we discussed earlier, I don't think the Biden administration has prioritized very clearly what it wants to accomplish. Um, and so I think that's more in a broader basket of of issues where the the strategy for now is we want to team up with our allies, but you know, and as we develop, you know, that that team of allies that will take on China, we will also figure out what our priorities are going to be uh when the when the fighting starts i don't think that's i i don't i'm not totally clear on what the priorities are there yeah i agree this is a i think one of the most interesting questions at the moment but the answer is very very much in the air mm, i i've been thinking a lot about what the expectation of biden is for it for this alliance that he is building uh, but um for example when when um in december eu and and china um, decided to um, make a political agreement on on in, uh, having a new investment agreement. Um, I mean, that was something that was also flagged by the U.S. Uh, new administration, saying that they would like the EU to coordinate this issue with them. So that that was only sign sign there, just to have a, have a bit concrete what that could be. But on, on, as I said earlier, trade policy is quite difficult area to do very ambitious uh, cooperation with, with the US and, 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 and the EU as we see our, each other maybe more as uh, competitors than, than actually partners. But in a sense, that's also an area where the EU has competence and is able to do things. So it might come up in the end, that trade policy is, is is what the U.S. will ask for 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 EU to do when they want to do closer cooperation with China. But let's see. Yeah, no, I I, I think you know I think Europe is still in a relatively sort of enviable position, and I'm kind of uh, shifting towards the next question, which is about the Biden trade policy to push towards Latin America and about Brazil. Um, and possible sort of climate policy uh, provisions invoked as part of the prospective discussions, because I mean Europe at least still has the industrial base that it does, and it can basically, from that industrial base, uh, you know, carve out different kinds of you know prospects in the direction of uh, in the direction of China in ways that many other uh, parts of the world it cannot. Whether, you know, it should follow a sort of strongly independent stance is a different question. I mean, whether that's the smart thing down the road. I mean, I, I sort of raised in the, the briefing paper that there's what sort of China is sort of doing a version of Kissingerian triangular diplomacy and uh, 
and 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 this time around china is trying to separate europe from the united states uh if the last time around it was the united states uh, having such a uh sort of diplomatic approach so i think europe should be aware of this is what's going on it doesn't necessarily mean it needs to sort of fully align with what everything everything that washington says but i think you know sort of always keeping in mind that that's what's you know that's what's potentially going on uh is i think really really important and i think you know on that on that point i think you know i'll take the first stab at this question about uh, about latin america um Yes, I mean, I think any agreement, and this would be very tough, a tough thing to sell uh, to Brazil uh, under any, any administration, if the Mercosur deal will ever be uh, ratified, and uh, you know, it will have to have stronger provisions that it has now. I mean, I think that's become pretty clear uh, in the debate, you know, in the last couple of years, ever since um, it was signed. And uh, Biden has been talking, of course, about carbon taxes at the carbon tariffs at the border and carbon taxes and all sorts of and integrating climate policy and trade policy. So there's a strong element of that. And and I think to make the earlier point about Europe's relative strength here is that, you know, say if if the Biden administration pushes Brazil hard on 5G, Brazil set, set you know, Brazil makes up, you know, Bra uh, the US and EU together combine to less uh, than China in the trade relationship uh, with uh, um, with Brazil. So China, so US, EU uh, together have less trade with Brazil than China does these days. And and in that situation, China may be, well, if you don't want our 5G, maybe we don't want our soy. We'll go somewhere else. Who else is soy? For example, the United States. And we have this phase one deal and we should, you know, we should honor that. So I think uh, Europe has, that's a long way to say that Europe has a, actually relatively strong cards in this game and therefore should be sort of relatively sort of careful about the way it plays them because it could actually end up doing relatively well out of it. I don't know what my uh, other co-panelists here think uh, about this question. So I want to push back a bit on your on the, the carbon tax discussion. I, I don't... I don't see how that's how that's going to happen anytime soon. I think to the extent that there's going to be dramatic climate policy action from the Biden administration, it will take the form of building lots of windmills and solar panels, uh, you know, so much more, uh, you know, industrial policy, if you if you want to call it that, but really just, you know, creating employment in the in the climate industry, I think, will be what it will look like. I, I think I, I, that that seems pretty clear. To, I mean, I find it hard to imagine even when the carbon tax discussion would start and we who would be in favor of it beyond Janet Yellen and, you know, a, a, a number of other economists. Uh, I just think they the way they think about it, they've now done their recovery plan and then or their rescue plan. And then next they're going to turn to a recovery plan. That recovery plan will involve less domestic spending on what they call infrastructure, but that infrastructure will include uh, a lot of renewable energy or and climate policy oriented investment, right? So solar panels, uh, wind panels, refurbishing buildings, uh, th those kinds of things, money, may maybe stuff for electro uh, electrical vehicles. Um, and and I, th that's just a different path from the carbon tax path. And so that I, I wanted to make sure I yeah, got that I, I got that in. Yeah. Maybe there'll be some tax increases in that package, but I think those will be uh, uh, taxes on the wealthy, you know, so to, so to speak. Yeah, I think I think just to say, yes, I think the carbon tax is at the end of the line in many ways. I do think that the carbon tariff conversation can work as a Trojan horse for some of the carbon tax policy as well. That, you know, once once if if some sort of carbon tariff becomes part of trade policy, then it, be it becomes easier to. I mean, it. maybe, but if you don't have a carbon tax at home and you're imposed and you're introducing a carbon tariff, then you just have a tariff. Well, that's that's indeed the case. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but that's but, but that could that, but I think that seems more plausible in some ways. It, after after seeing what the public procurement, the Buy American rules look like now versus what they looked like even you know it, earlier in January. I mean, it seems like that kind of, there's a real potential for that kind of strong push. And 
And I think in some ways those, you know, went relatively unnoticed by European audiences last year, the extent to which, you know, Biden was pushing for very strong rules and public procurement and, you know, preventing even Canadians selling, you know, uh, selling to the U.S. Uh, in these cases. Anyway, Sila, did you have anything? On this? Well, um, yeah, the timing is a bit concerning. If, if in your paper, Lauri, you point out that this is an area where EU and, and US has a lot of potential to do cooperation, but also you say that it might end up uh, taking these two parties uh, at the brink of trade war again uh, if they are not able to do a cooperation so timing is a is a concern here if, if the us is moving really slowly on this and the eu is already uh, going to have a proposal from the commission uh, by the uh, during summer so uh, and and the eu might then end up uh, going to move unilaterally without doing the cooperation with the US. So uh, 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 let, let, let's see. But it, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm yeah, I'm think, you know, looking at another question here, which is about how big the important the business model of US big tech is for the US and DC and whether that can be a bridge of transatlantic and cooperation. So I mean one and if for the U for Europe on the other on the other hand, it's climate. It, is there a sort of way in which we could see a sort of climate tech trade type of combo counts, whatever it would be that would bring the number one priorities from both sides together and then, you know, we could sort of hash out something that's not called TTIP and doesn't include agricultural products or anything, but would at least, you know, do away with some of the uncertainty we face right now. I, mean, I don't know what we would be swapping. Uh, and what would the, like the US would, the, the EU would get to impose a digital service tax and the US would get to impose a carbon tax on, on German cars. That would be the, I that mean, would be the agreement. That seems entirely implausible to me. But, yeah, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's the problem. And that's the likeliest, ver and I think that's the likeliest embodiment of that of that trade. Yeah, yeah. I mean, or the agreement would be that neither does, you know, you know, any of that. That could be the other, the, the sort of opposing, you know, we sure, agree. If, that, yeah, yeah, sure. If we reframe the question as, as can the status quo survive in these areas, then I'd say, yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, that's, I think, I, I, but I think the sort of centrality of different business models is a very important uh, point uh, here that we got. Um, uh, so uh, there's another, so that the, the OECD, uh, yeah, I think this, there's another one. We've actually discussed that, that it's not going to replace the the WTO. And, but I mean, I think there is a shift that Biden does, does see uh it, as more of a forum and i think it's related to this sort of summit of democracy stuff uh that's been going on here um if the if us and EU are more competitors in trade policy then what is the potential for corporations on standard settings for example and developing in the use of ai do you think there is something i think sila can uh maybe do you want to have the first uh take on this well, that at least that's flagged as one of the more promising areas of cooperation, where EU and and, and US uh, can have shared interest. But but I guess in a trade policy also related to our previous discussion, trade policy is always it, it's a negotiation when you give something and uh, I give something. And that's all. So, so that makes it a bit difficult. But, 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 yeah, yeah. I, I, I guess this um, AI, for example, I, I think it, 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 it's, it's something that that uh, both sides have interest in. Um, but let's see. Yeah, Stan. Anything? Any thoughts? Not a ton. I mean, obviously, the 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 countries have gone have gone their own way, right? There's data protection rules in the EU that look very different from from the US. Uh, you know, I mean, there's I, I, it depends a little bit, I think, on what aspects you have in mind. But so far, I think the economically, the most relevant applications of, of AI are to send ads to, to people who are using social media or the Internet generally. Uh, 
Um, and so there, I don't. I think we've seen basically com complete co divergence. So I, I don't see why that would necessarily change. But yeah, no, that makes sense. I actually, the something this is not off the you know conversations right now, but it's something that Stan mentioned. Stan mentioned Nord Stream and and Russia policy and all of this. I mean, this is of course something. Uh, in some ways, I thought I, my sense was that towards sort of the late Trump administration, there was more divergence uh, between. Uh, between Europe and Americans on this question uh, until really Navalny. And Navalny kind of, you know, once he became, you know, once the attack on his life occurred, and then I think Europe started sort of making uh, making its way perhaps closer to the U.S. positions on, on these issues. I'm wondering on the sort of, I mean, obviously there are many security implications and there's the energy side of this, but I'm wondering like, what what how do you see the implications for sort of, trade policy, uh, you know, the, the divergences and convergences on, on Russia uh, among um, in Brussels and Washington and beyond. Obviously, Berlin matters too and Houston. You want to start, Stan? Well, I think there's, you know, I think the, the German government and the US government are very different positions and priorities and I don't think they <laughs> they're particularly close to to coming to an agreement on, on the, I mean the good thing is it's about very narrow issues ultimately but it's about it's about oil and gas and it's not that, that, that there's no I don't think I think the issues are very clear and there's just a disagreement and that's that's just going to happen it's probably for the best that it's remained somewhat isolated from other from other issues as we as we discussed earlier I think it's much harder to imagine a situation where the EU, the EU and the US work out all of these very disparate issues with both trade and national security implications in one comprehensive deal. Um, I, I think some issues are, are easier to solve than others. I think as Saida pointed out, the easiest one to issue is the Boeing uh, Airbus issue um, that's getting done. I don't think it would be helpful if we drew all these issues into one big negotiation. Um, and so I think this one is one where the likely outcome is just uh, you know agree to disagree. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I think there's yeah I think yeah there's definitely there's this also sort of developing sense that the that the sort of EU US Russia dynamics are very different from the EU uh, EU US China dynamics that you know the US will continue to have to sort of learn to live. With some differences over Russia policy, simply because of sort of proximity, but I think uh, on and so yeah, so the U.S. will go a little further on the on on imposing sanctions. I think on on specific Russian persons and firms and and industries, then the EU will be willing to to go. But I don't think the U.S. is going to embrace a super aggressive pro democracy agenda either. To be honest, uh, right? If Biden is unwilling to impose sanctions on on Mohammed bin Salman, bin Salman personally, then he's not going to, but that's, if, if you're not willing to do that, then you're definitely not going to take any kind of dramatic action uh, to protect Navalny or Hong Kong or Xinjiang. Yeah, no, I, I, I do think that the sort of democracy agenda from, uh, from Washington is looking much more of sort of expanding the club of those who are already sort of qualify rather than trying to flip countries that wouldn't qualify. I think that's the, or, and then also sort of raising the stature of those who already qualify, I think is, is sort of a fair way, uh, fair way of, uh, of putting it. Uh, Sila, anything, anything you wanted to add on, onto this or still mm -hmm. yeah, on, on that point? Yeah, no, I think, um, I think there's one of the big questions that I've been having is really, you know, on this question about Joe Biden trade and sort of more his sort of, you know, relations with the outside world question is that we're looking at a man with a 50, you know, 50 year career in the highest level of politics. So like, if you look at any moment in his, you know, you could pick a moment in his career, you can say, oh yeah, look, that's Joe Biden. He believes in trade or he believes in this and he believes in that because he's managed to be, you know, I mean, this is not a criticism. This is just a, something to point out that he's been in public life forever. Um, and and, you know, so he's been on all these different sides of these different issues. I'm just wondering what could uh, Europeans and others do to really sort of 
you know, recover the sort of pro trade Biden that was once there, like vocally so. Uh, sometimes even, you know, something of a co-leader in these issues. Is there are there like actions that people should be thinking about? I, mean, I don't think that's necessarily a goal for the. I mean, I think the the politics in Europe aren't that much easier. Uh, you know, even for a trade agreement with the with the U.S. Right, as you, as we we're seeing now with the deal with Mercosur, it's just not that straightforward. And a deal with the U.S. would be, you know, just of much more quantitative importance. Um, and so I, I I don't know I. I'm, I think what the what the EU should try to do in the trade area, as in others, is not necessarily to try and go for some you know ultra neoliberal vision of the world, because I just don't think that's quite going to happen. I think it would be better to focus on trying to draw the U.S. into some of the multilateral institutions, um, and and think of ways to embed them, uh, so that and to make it clear how the U.S. benefits from them. Uh, so that they don't get immediately abandoned next time a Republican president is elected. Yeah. So basically be like, I'd love to have this conversation. Let's go have it at the WTO. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, you know, Sila probably doesn't disagree with that, right? No, and, and I am just hoping that the as, as EU is moving forward with its trade agreements, it will eventually lead to a situation where the U.S. has no other option than to start moving as well. Yeah, I mean, I'd, the EU I'd, should certainly not block exports of vaccines, for example. That would be that would be a helpful helpful move it, forward. Yeah, no, it, that's. I mean, that's. Yeah, and and that's that's obviously been a question of internal EU politics as well, and not and not simply. Uh, no, that's it, it's it's a hornet's nest. That question of how. Yeah, I just saw someone post yesterday that you know right now. India is vaccinating more people per day than than the EU is. So, you know, it's uh, it will raise all sorts of kind of kinds of questions about trade in Europe, yeah. understandably so. And then, you know, more on the broader democracy agenda, the, the, there's been a lot of backsliding near the in, in, both inside the EU and just outside of it. And in 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 Egypt after the revolution in Turkey, obviously, um, now in Belarus, I don't think the EU has been super visible uh, in Hungary and Poland, and so you know that I think that that would be a good area of focus for the for the EU too. Yeah. Now in the internal issues, I think that's something actually that you know is felt quite strongly in the U.S. That you know EU has these internal democracy issues that it really should be sort of handling, and that there should be in some ways I think people in Washington are sort of wary of even wading into that because they don't want to sort of mess with internal EU affairs. Well, obviously, the previous administration was very pro uh, Orban and pro the current Polish government. And so yeah. that also complicates the matter, right? If if you yeah. have a, an explicit pro authoritarian agenda, those issues look very different. Yeah. And I'm just going to say that, you know, but that that's not necessarily flipping. It doesn't mean that, you know, this agenda, this this government wants to be openly critical, that too critical either, you know, in a way that would sort of, they would expect Brussels to sort of move more strongly first is I think the way of uh, thinking, about, you know, think, thinking about that sort of question. So um, I, I think that's anything, Sila, do you have any uh, points on this or? Yeah, no, I think we're we're almost, we're almost at a close, uh, almost at a close here. Anything sort of final points that, Anybody wants to make about what to, you know, what to expect uh, from U sort of U.S. trade policy? You know, I give you just a, you know, each of you sort of thirty seconds before we sort of close. I'd say I'd say two things. I'd say first, uh, everyone should read Lowry's paper, uh, and then second, the U.S. will uh, start importing a lot more stuff this year because uh, there is massive fiscal loosening and presumably a large GDP growth. And surely some of that will be will turn into international trade. So I think that's in that sense the U.S. will make even keeping the rules constant. I think the U.S. will will uh, will help international trade recover from the from the uh, from the hit it's it's taken during the pandemic. Well, what I take from our discussion is that I think we all need a bit of patience, and we all just have to wait a bit to see what concretely 
is going to happen doing Biden on, on trade policy. Um, USTR seems to focus now on, on just reviewing everything that happened under Trump. And that will take some time. And I, I think we'll have to convene at some time when we we have some more action and uh, in, in, in addition to the, just, uh, just, just the talk. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you. No, I think I would, you know, my sort of final sort of concluding thought is that, you know, T TPP came out of years without the trade promotion authority and, and Biden only went and uh, Obama only went and got the TPA renewed once he actually wanted to uh, wanted to act on it. So uh, there's a good chance that there are conversations ongoing that, you know, uh, that, you know, are at a level that we don't necessarily even hear about them yet. So patience, patience is, is key. And and let's get let Biden get through his 100 days and we'll have a better idea what you know, what comes up, you know, after that. But thank you to you, Sila. Thank you to Stan for joining me. And thank you for everybody at FIA who made this possible. And thank you for all the great questions. I will now move to end this meeting. Have a great day.